Hi, welcome to the Noise Path. In this episode, we're going to try another unusual repair. As promised on Patreon, I'm going to try and post these little short videos whenever I get an opportunity. This is a Turbo 8060 precision scale. It has a maximum weight measurement capability of 60 grams and one milligram of resolution. It was sold as is without any power adapter and it was quite inexpensive, so I couldn't resist passing on. So let's go ahead and plug it in and see what it does. The back of the unit has an RS-232 port, a USB port, this little bubble balance is very important for these things to be completely flat, and a 12 volt supply center positive. Should be easy to plug something in there. Alright, let's try turning it on. It does seem to turn on, it displays that, I don't know what that is, probably some firmware revision perhaps. And let's see, and it just says unload. So it's interesting, every couple of times when I turn it on, it actually does show something. Now this unload is apparently indicating that it thinks that there is a weight on this that it wants you to remove so that it can boot and essentially zero itself out. And it can't do that. Now sometimes when I turn it on and off and I press some of these buttons in random successions, it kind of gets out of that mode. There you go, so you get this, which you know seems to be good, but then the measurements don't make sense. Like if I press and I let go, you know, it stays at some weird number. So there's definitely something wrong with it. It's worthwhile taking it apart. And these two dots apparently also mean that it thinks that there is a weight in there and it cannot zero itself out. So clearly some issue internally. And here's the internal structure of this precision scale. I've always really liked these kind of mechanical designs because of the intricate equilibrium between the different weights and movements and how they're connected. They're essentially translating movements by very precise amounts so that you can get these tiny sensors to measure what is a very, very fine change in movement. And here's the design of this one. And you can see there are two sensors in here. There's one over here, which is an optical sensor clearly between these two sides. And there's one on the other side with a very neat connection, which I will show you next. A whole bunch of adjustments and screws and so on which you really don't want to touch otherwise this whole thing will be out of calibration and if I push on this you can see that this will move at the end here and there's a very very small amount of movement remember this can measure only 60 grams to begin with so it's really really high precision here and then there's a sensor on the other side which we have to see so clearly both of these go into this analog board gets amplified and translated and digitized and it goes into this main board here the LCD screen is on this side, and everything has these ferrite cores around it, which is kind of neat. So the problem is either with some movement with some of these sensors or this analog board, if we are not able to settle with some actual measurement, it tells, keeps telling us that it has to be unloaded. So there's some saturation of something inside of this. Let's look on the other side too. And here's the other side, and you can see how they're connecting the sensor from the bottom here to the top using these super fine cables that are conductive, essentially they're wires, but they're so fine and flexible that they don't load this interface because you can see that they have to move with respect to each other. It's really cool. If you pull on these, obviously you break them and you damage the whole thing. And I think I may have found at least one thing that's wrong with it. If you look carefully, you've probably already seen it too. It's this little joint here. It's actually broken. So if you zoom in a bit more, you can see it. So if I pull this, these will join each other. So basically you want these to be connected and that's how it stays in equilibrium. And like this is basically kind of floating and it's sitting at the bottom, which is probably why it thinks that it is saturated because of this broken link. So then we have to find a way to fix this. Now, why would this link be broken? For a few reasons, it could have been somebody, somebody dropped something on it or maybe the whole thing fell, but there are quite a few of these around. You can see there's one over here, there's one over there, because these things have to move with respect to each other and they use a whole bunch of these. I don't know what this is made of, but it's very thin, so maybe we could just find something else and cut it to this shape and replace it. So here's my attempt at fixing this piece. I explored a couple of different options and I thought that perhaps patching it is the best way. This is a lot more intricate than it seems on the surface. For example, if you look at its profile, you can see how thin some regions of it are, and that's because it's supposed to flex in those places. And this looks like that it's been done with some machining, that they've machined these areas thinner, and this was essentially one stamped piece originally. So I drilled two tiny holes there so that solder can flow, and I put a piece of nickel on it, and I soldered it, and I flattened it as much as I could. And it is roughly the, you know, the right shape and right size. So this is the best I can do at the moment, but ultimately, if this doesn't work, we're going to have to find probably a replacement of this piece entirely. I can always write to the manufacturer and see if they're willing to sell me one of these pieces. But nonetheless, let's go and install this and see what happens. And here's the link installed back on the instrument. And now the principal operation of this unit is a lot more clear. This is a system at equilibrium using a PID controller, some kind of a feedback system. These two wires most likely go into an electromagnet. That electromagnet can move this platform a tiny amount. But as we saw on the other side, there's an optical sensor and there's a lever that amplifies that movement. 
And the system constantly tries to balance this and hover it right in the middle such that that optical sensor is essentially at its threshold. Now imagine I add weight on top of this. As soon as I do that, I will disturb that optical sensor equilibrium point and the instrument needs to then adjust the magnetic field to compensate for that and bring this back into the middle. The change in the PID parameters that controls the loop of course that's proportional to the weight, the force that's being applied on this and that's what's digitized and ultimately correlated with whatever you put on top of this. It's very clever but it's by no means unique. This idea of having a feedback network with some PID controller that you add a disturbance to and then looking and see how the network reacts to that, that is used in a lot kind of different instrumentation, even LCR meters, when I was talking about their principal operation. Now in this type of precision scales, you're relying on this movement and achieving this equilibrium, and you're not using something like a strain gauge. Strain gauges are great because they have very, very little movement and they can measure extremely high forces, but they're not very good at measuring extremely small changes in force, very small weights. This is excellent at that. It can measure tiny amounts. There are scales that can measure even below this. So now that it's kind of fixed up, let's put it together and see if it actually works and we can calibrate it. There we go, we're reading zero, which is nice. I have a couple of weights over here. We can quickly try out the scale. So here's a 50 gram weight. See what we get? That's pretty good, I would say. It's almost, it's almost exactly 50 anyway. That's good. Now let's try something much, much smaller. How about one gram? There's one gram, there you go. Yeah, it's almost one gram. And this means that the measurement has stabilized. That's good. Now we can go for something really, really small. Let's say point one gram. I have to be careful with these because you don't want to touch these. The oil in the hand actually can change the weight of these. Oh, perfect. Look at that. That is really good. Let's try something even smaller. Let's make sure we zero that. And let's try something tiny. Now this is going to be a difficult measurement. You're going to have to be patient with this one because the movement is so slow. So it'll take some time to stabilize. Okay, we're measuring 0 0.008. I mean, it's pretty close. I'm not sure how accurate these weights are, but we can also do a displacement, a small addition. So here is one gram like before. There we go. We can add 0.1 to it. Look at that. That's perfect. That's really great. And we can add this last piece on top of that. Let's see if we can catch it. It's trying. There you go. I mean, that's pretty amazing. Let's see if we can capture the evaporation of something like acetone that evaporates readily in the atmosphere at room temperature. So I have a container there. We're going to tear that. So we go to zero. And I have a syringe here with some acetone in it. Let's pour it into this container. There we go. And now let's wait and see what happens. There you go, about 1.2 grams. And look at that. It's slowly evaporating. Because we're measuring one milligram at a time, and acetone will evaporate fairly quickly, look at that, it's going down continuously. It's pretty amazing to see what is essentially almost invisible to the eye. You'd have to wait for a while to notice that it is reducing volume, but yeah, it's going pretty fast. And there you have it. I hope you enjoyed this quick video. I want to thank all the supporters of the channel, whether it's on Patreon or PayPal. You really make all these things possible, and I will try to do more of these quick repairs around the lab. Let me know what you think in the comment section. See you next time.